everyone's checking out and leaving and stuff. So, but we are going to get some interviews today. So hopefully that makes it an awesome day instead of being Yourself. I am Jan Scott Frazier. Mm -hmm. I am a director and producer of animation, among many other things. I did manga and comics. I do a lot of public speaking. Um, I go to a lot of conventions, and obviously that's public speaking as well, of a sort. Um, I teach art and creativity, um, and I cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay indeed. Yes, no, that is good. So I've been wanting to really learn how to animate and stuff and I've been wondering what software do they use in the animations? Mm, that's a good question. They use a, a number of different things. Um, in Japan most animation to this day is still drawn on paper and then scanned in and then colored. Um, so they're using uh, systems like Retas Pro, R-E-T-A-S, um, which should be retas.com should be the US space for that I'm not entirely certain but Retas is a big one um, they use um, what is it um, we when I when I was there we used to use Animo but Animo was bought out by Toon Boom and I'm not entirely certain what happened to that software to be honest still around. oh is it okay. Toon Boom is okay Toon yeah Toon Boom I know the company's still around but mm -hmm. I'm not sure what they did with Animo I don't know if they merged it into their uh, other software or what Toon but Boom Studio yeah. I've heard that Toon Boom's pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah definitely it's used all over the world for production so yeah um, and then of course you know Photoshop and that kind of stuff and they do backgrounds and whatever painter etc for manga of course um, uh, Clip Studio Manga Studio is the winner by far that one just owns the market over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and with Photoshop, of course, Photoshop is involved in everything. Yes, Photoshop is basically the world right now. Well, it's it's the baseline. It's yes. the it's the you know the basic tool. It's know, knowing how to use a pencil these days. Mm -hmm. A big fat monstrous scary digital pencil that sucks up all your memory. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for the help. I've been learning how to animate a little bit, and mm -hmm. I've been really trying to be able to animate and I've been watching a lot of anime and stuff and noting everything that I'm really seeing which is really helping me in my animation stuff which okay. is excellent which I'm really enjoying being able to do that stuff excellent yeah excellent um, so a question that's been lingering in my mind for a little bit um, is uh, you've been to Japan and mm -hmm. you've worked in Japan and anime and stuff what do they think of our dubs over here where people are like speaking for the characters, English people? Well, okay, there's something very important to understand mm -hmm. with dubs and dubbing animation is that if you don't speak the language that you're listening to, for instance with Japanese, it sounds amazing and you love anime, it's like, oh, that's super awesome, but in reality, there were a lot of times when I sat in that studio, keep pushing that button, go, no, again, no, say it again, no, say it again. And even then I couldn't get a good performance. So it's not like all those actors are brilliant by any means. <laughs> um, so the, to be absolutely honest, the level of detail that goes into recording the voices here is far, far in, in excess of what we did in Japan. Because mm -hmm. in Japan we do gang recording, everyone records together, mm -hmm. and we record two for one there, which in other words, if we had a, a 23 minute TV episode, we'd have about 45 minutes to record it, about an hour um, in studio time, and so we were very forced into that, so everyone had to do it together. Whereas here, they take individual actors, and they might give them you know, a few hours each to, to fit episodes or things like that. I mean, now everyone's faster, but still, it's it's, you know, it takes a lot longer than they do. They, you know, match the, the, the dialogue to the mouth where we were kind of loose with that. You know, we just, as long as it was mostly right, we were okay. Um, so, you know, the quality is higher. There's that. And as far as content, as long, you know, the, the, if the Japanese artists listen to it, most of them aren't very great with English. So they hear it and it's like, oh, there's my work in, in English, you know. So there's been, you know, in the past there's been some people who weren't happy with some of the casting decisions just because they listened to the voice and they're like, well, that's not what I heard in my mind. Um, but there's been also been ones where, like, American audiences weren't happy with the Japanese director's casting as, uh, um, decisions, like Ghost in the Shell when they cast the main character 
um, the director wanted her to be very kind of without emotional affect, kind of flat, um, which comes through in the movie, but people complained that she was too flat, that she was too unemotional, but that's what he wanted. So it's, yeah. So uh, they're happy that the work gets seen here, that they, that their work gets seen anywhere. But um, I don't think, they don't have judgment about quality or anything like that as much, so, if that makes yeah. sense. Well, I've heard that they don't really like it because we treat it more like a cartoon thing over here. Well, I've, I've heard that they kind of treat it a little more serious in Japan. Um, I must admit that I have not heard that. That was not my experience mm -hmm. in, in Japan. Because, um, I mean, ultimately, when we were making kid shows, we were making kid shows. When we were making a show for that the demographic was like 13 to 18, then that's, it, you know, we found that actually most of that stuff plays about the same. Like a show like, um, uh, like Naruto, for instance. Naruto has almost the same demographic here that it does in Japan, with the exception of more women involved mm -hmm. here than are in Japan, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, by a bit. But, you know, some shows, there's been things that were popular in the U.S. that were not popular in Japan, and things that were very popular in Japan that were not popular here. Most of that's culturally oriented. So, um, really, the biggest difference is kind of how adult anime is seen. That kind of stuff is, is somewhat different. But, yeah, for kid shows especially, it's really kind of the same. I mean, you know, they... Sailor Moon is really the dialogue isn't that much different from the American to the Japanese, and it's it in the beginning they put they kind of aimed it for kids, but it moved right to the dem same demographic in Japan. Mm -hmm. It's the same age groups and same you know everything as in Japan, which I find quite fascinating actually. Mm -hmm. So you've worked in Japan and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, my dad's worked in Japan for a little mm -hmm. bit, and he. You know, was his company. He did tri business trips to Japan. Okay. So my question is, did they treat you with a little bit of respect? Because you even, or did they kind of treat you a little bit with less respect or anything because you were from America? Japan is a very homogenous society. Everyone's kind of very similar in the in looks and tastes and ideas and stuff. I mean, uh, not super similar, of course, but. As a very different looking person and a person who didn't speak the language very well, when I went there, it was very strange. Ever, I, I used to joke that I felt like a panda sometimes in the zoo. People would be like looking at me weirdly and things like that. You know, that was also in the 80s and 90s when there weren't as many foreigners over there as there are now. Um, and for the most part, I, I, it, the overt acts of like racism things, there was only a couple times where people made comments like that. But I certainly hit the ceiling. I certainly hit the ceiling in the industry. I, there was, there was, I, my main director, which was awesome, but there were things they wouldn't allow me to direct, like cultural stuff, historical things like that. Sci-fi was always great, which I want to do that anyway. But there were, I, I heard, you don't understand the culture. I've heard that in, you know, a number of times when I got to that level. So there is this, there is a ceiling, I think. I mean, obviously people have done their own stuff, but, you know, it depends on where the money comes from as to where that ceiling is, you know, because if it's a, if an American company has money in it, yeah, then the ceiling's much higher. So. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite anime that you've worked on? Oh, my gosh, my favorite anime that I've worked on. Um, Blood, the Last Vampire was really a cool movie. Mm -hmm. That looked really good. I really liked the way that came out. Um, of course, Ghost in the Shell was interesting. I didn't work that all that much on the movie. Um, boy, that's a good question. Um, Susie Chan and Marby was this show for NHK. That was the first thing I ever directed, so I have a very soft spot in my heart for that show. That was a kid's show, too. Um, and I had so much fun working on that. I, I liked doing the storyboards. I liked writing. And I didn't write it, but I mean, I liked doing the, uh, the layouts, everything for it. That was a lot of fun. Very simple characters and simple stories. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite anime in general? Like your favorite anime that you watch? You don't have to work on that or anything. Mm, my favorite anime in general. Well, that's a good question. I like so many. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to say, if I had to pick one, it would. It was called Bobby ni Kubitake, and it was Bobby's Girl. Would have been the English language mm -hmm. uh, title, or Bobby Steady, if you want, want to get kind of old language a little bit archaic um, and it was a, a short movie that was made by this pro special projects team from Madhouse Studios um, they wanted to make some stuff for film festivals and things to really show off what they could do so what we need Kubitake is a traditional animation it has these really cool lighting effects but it also has watercolor work it has pencil work there's pens there's all these different styles of animation in it and it's genius the animation it is absolutely beautiful 
cool. It's genius. The story is from a, um, a comment, a manga by uh, Banana Yoshimoto. Um, and uh, it's just, it's very simple. It's about this guy who wants to figure out, young guy who wants to figure out what he wants to do with his life after high school. Um, but it's gorgeous. And, you know, it has a kind of intense ending. So, that yeah, Bobby's Girl, Bobini Kubitake. Which nobody knows anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a, that sounds like a pretty cool anime. Yeah. It's very impressive. Yeah. All right, I'll probably watch that soon. I if you can find it, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So we are heading to Japan in only a couple <laughs> weeks. So do you have any recommendations on where we should go? Well, um, I always suggest that people travel when they can. You know, like go to Tokyo and Osaka because you know the cuisine's different and the fe the city the feeling of the cities are different. Mm -hmm. And then um, I like I really like Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Kyoto is a very beautiful city, very historic, and they have We're cool temples. Stay in Kyoto. Kyoto for a little bit. Excellent. Yeah, it's beautiful. Kyoto is also nice because it has it's the, basically the only really big city in Japan that has a grid layout for the streets, so you can find stuff easily, um, which is not the case in Tokyo. Um, there's, uh, of course, you could go down to Kyushu, the southern island. Um, there's all sorts of cool stuff to do there. There's uh, on the way there. There's of course Hiroshima, um, which is a beautiful city and you know obviously has to some you know historic value for both our nations. We're taking a day trip to Hiroshima. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, some people really like Hokkaido, the north, you know, um, um, uh, I almost said Nagoya, which is in the middle of the country, um, um, Nagano and Hokkaido and Sapporo and places like that. Some people really love that. I never actually made it up there. The furthest north I ever made in Japan was Sendai, because um, we had a studio there. But yeah, I never made it up to Hokkaido. It sounds kind of fun to me. <laughs> Thanks for the recommendations. I'm pretty excited to go to Japan, and oh, yeah. we're gonna and we're gonna do lots of cool stuff. Like there's a, like the Monkey Temple. All oh, right. Okay. Temple thing. Um, I I have really no idea what many of these things are called, and we're gonna be on the hunt for as much Hunter X Hunter stuff as we can find. Okay. Yeah, good luck. Yes. Good luck. Excellent. It's in, we haven't really found much merchandise like in the con or mm -hmm. anything like over here. So we're gonna so when we're over there. I hope we're going to at least find a little bit of Hunter x Hunter stuff, which I'm, I'm too. excited to, yeah. I'm pretty too. Cool. Mm -hmm. okay. So what's the process of making an anime, an episode of anime, or even a whole thing? Well, that's kind of a big question, honestly, because you're talking about a process that has hundreds of people involved and takes months. Um, it starts out with the story, um, turns to storyboards, which are kind of like a comic version of mm -hmm. it, um, then layouts. Um, then key animation, in between animation, then that goes to coloring. Like now, of course, it's computers, so you would have the scanning, and then you have the color people, or the, the, the people who color it, I should say, that makes kind of more sense. Um, and then that is all combined and composited with the background, so you have the background people making their stuff too. And so that's composited with the backgrounds, and then it's given motion and camera moves and all that kind of stuff. So you have your different directors mm -hmm. and assistant directors and assistant assistant directors and the Inshitsu and all these people. Um, and there's also checks on this, so every step of that way, the directors check this. Um, and um, let's see, so it goes into coloring and then compositing, and then once the compositing is done, um, you take it to sound effects um, and dubbing. And in Japan, of course, dubbing is, I know it's kind of weird, it's sound effects. So um, we had the, we'll have the voice recording and sound effects, usually a voice recording comes first, not always. Um, we'll do that, and then we'll put in any kind of other stuff that needs to happen to it, and then it ends up on its, hopefully, its final format. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, again, that's months worth of project there, and of course it depends on what it is. Like a movie is basically the same format, but it's gonna take a lot more to people and stuff, because the quality's higher. And you also have, um, sometimes you'll have like integration with 3D elements, or other text elements, or something like that, and of course you would have groups who, or, in, or specialists who work on that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so it's it's a pretty involved process, and it takes it can take, I don't know, depending on the size of your studio and how many subcontractors you have, it can take two weeks to a month or two months to make a TV episode. It's, it's really interesting because I've animated really tiny shorts, mm -hmm. and I've been pretty lazy because most of my voice, most of my lip syncing is just three frames duplicated over and over again in random orders. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it works. 
So yeah, that we, that's, uh, although it's not completely random, that's kind of the way that we did dialogue too. We have these things that look like, um, kind of like spreadsheets. They're called exposure sheets or time shippo in Japan. Um, and it was a series of columns and what it was is it was to show, how, well, of course they do this digitally too, it shows what goes, each frame of film or video is the vertical and is, is the um, rows, I guess. And each column is a level. So, like, let's say you have A. So A1, let, let's say I, I am just sitting here talking to you and I'm not moving my body. So A1 is my body. And then B might be my mouth because my mouth is moving. And then C might be my eyes blinking. So different layers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, the timesheet, when we would do dialogue, what we would do is we'd see where the mouth is generally open and generally closed. And we would mark those and then the rest of them we would kind of fit because we had... Close, middle, open was our basic. And of course, it depends on your budget. The more money you have, the better you can lip sync. So. Yeah. What I've been doing is I have my mouth that have teeth that has teeth showing, a mouth mm -hmm. completely closed, and a mouth that's just open. Mm -hmm. And I just duplicate them in a random order, and then either uh -huh. add voice acting myself or have text appear on the screen or something. And it works for the small lazy animations that I do. But if I ever want to do some sort of fancy thing, then I'll probably pay attention to what each mouth looks like with each letter and stuff, so I can do that. That's a, It's kind of interesting that you mentioned that, because you don't want to do each mouth, e each letter, because that's not technically the way we speak, because we, we slur our letters and consonants together, and we blend things. So, like when you, um, one of the good examples is, is you watch like The Simpsons, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, the Simpsons, I think they have what, oh my god, it's been so long, A through E mouths, I think they have like five or seven different mouth shapes. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. But they don't, you can't hit every beat because if you do, it looks like Akira. Akira looked like this. They were all talking very intensely like this. Um, in, in Japanese, of course, that's like beginner. That, that's like, that's animation student lip sync mistakes. But since we didn't lip sync, you know, except for American shows, which a lot of people hadn't worked on, that's why Akira looked the kind of bizarre way it did. So yeah, I mean, you, you, of course you're going to want to read up on lip sync, um, but yeah, it's not actually every consonant. It's um, it's large vowels, uh, plosives, um, that kind of stuff. Plosive is like puh, 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 uh, peas and things like that, bees and peas, um, things that make your mouth kind of pop. Um, and things like that, whereas like things like um, glottal stops, which is that kind of stuff, um, you don't see that. That that my my lips, I don't even have to move. So we don't, we wouldn't lip sync that particular part. It's actually quite the art. I'm not very good at it. I since I did, you know, the vast majority of what I did was Japanese. I didn't really learn to lip sync super great. I know how to do it, but. <laughs> Well, thanks for taking a couple minutes to yes, hear Yes, I'm happy to talk with you. Thanks for having me. It's time to press the subscribe button. A subscribe button. A subscribe button. A subscribe button. Bye, 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 bye.